Yes, thank you very much for uh, organizing this great conference. When I first heard about or this workshop uh, about it, I, I, I really thought this is great, bringing together everyone on a uh, dope Hubbard model, such a, a topic which I've been working on for uh, a long time now. And um, I'm very happy to uh, tell you about our latest results in this uh, context. So my name is Simon Hilker. I work with Immanuel Bloch at the Max Planck Institute in Munich uh, on the Fermi Hubbard systems. And um, as you all know, the very core of the, the problem there is that the, the systems get very complicated in the sense that we want to understand materials with two spins, with um, non-trivial spin interactions and doping, and their mutual interactions basically leading to complex physical phases. In practice, what we do, we build such simulators with these little atoms lined up and um, basically try to bring those as close to the um, systems that we are interested in and adding all the tools to control and uh, read out what's actually going on. So um, the core question that I guess brought most of us here who are interested in doped Hubbard model is what really happens when you have an antiferromagnet and you dope it. And experimentally, of course, people figured out a lot is happening. It gets very complicated, lots of phases are coming up and um, it's really one of the central challenges uh, in the, in the field. Here I'm just showing this uh, one of many versions how people have been drawing a Coupre phase diagram. So coming based on the experimental results, uh, trying to um, summarize all the experimental results where one sees of course most famously these um, D-wave uh, superconductors. But then there are other phases like the charge order that are competing with these and um, tying this now to the microscopic description I think is really what's at the heart of this, uh, this problem. So basically, how does this microscopic model where we say, okay, we understand, we know a Hamiltonian that uh, moves around uh, spins uh, on a lattice uh, is connected to all of those phases. And um, in particular, one looks at then the doping to these holes, how do they uh, bring about basically the, um, these phases uh, which have been uh, shown there on the left. And of course, the superconducting phase is only the, the prime example that people always use but it's actually about the whole competition of phases that is emerging there. And uh, from the sense of quantum simulations, um, what we're doing is basically building a system which is much closer to the theoretical system here on the right and trying to see what can we deduce from that, what can we learn here about these uh, many-body physics. And more concretely, of course, especially in the context of this workshop, the question is what can be captured by the Hubbard model. So what is contained there and uh, what um, kind of phases actually exist and how close are they are to these experimental phases that have been measured here on the right. Um, so um, let me start at the very uh, basic example. So if we take a, a, a nail antiferromagnetic state and we poke it with a single hole and then we're wondering what's happening there. That's a kind of simple system which I think everybody would agree that is more or less understood. Uh, on a very simple example, well, the hole starts to move around and shift these spins which leads to some kind of frustration. So there's some energy cost associated with the hole moving in the lattice. And if it moves further, it costs more and more energy. Uh, so if I just plot this as a function of the length of how far the hole has moved, it basically creates its own potential. And uh, well, we know quantum mechanically, if the system is cold, it doesn't have the energy, it only does it virtually, and then it starts moving back. So basically, um, that shows you that this motion of the a uh, hole is, is really competing with the spin order. So as long as there's a spin order here, which gives this energy scale, uh, this process um, uh, suffers some, some energy penalty, which as long as the spin is completely frozen, the hole can't get very far. And um, then one can immediately say, okay, but what if I put two holes? And for two holes, now the situation is different because a single hole starts moving through the um, uh, material, this kind of frustration effect, instead of going back, the second hole can come and uh, repair these kind of damages. So this would be a very simple argument of why holes basically can bind together. And well, then you can say in the next step, um, these holes are fermion, ferro, uh, fermions, so we're binding two together, that forms a boson, and that could condense, and we're getting our uh, superconductor. So far, so easy. But of course, it's not quite that easy because this is a very simplified picture and um, this kind of magnetically mediated attraction here is only one out of many, many processes that are happening 
uh, if one looks at more realistic models than this one with the frozen uh, nail uh, background of spins. So in particular, this, this spin background is dynamic. So as soon as I turn on spin flip interactions in this, in this background, the whole situation gets uh, very hard to, to numerically calculate of what's actually going on. It, it's, it's famously known that this um, doping introduces these sign problems into, into uh, quantum Monte Carlo uh, calculations. So already the situation with two holes is, as far as I'm heard, and I'm happy to be corrected by anyone in the audience, something one can't brute force calculate. Um, so, um, but that doesn't mean that this, this mechanism here that underlies it um, is, uh, is, is not existing. And this is basically what we set out, and which I'm going to tell you about today, how we're trying to experimentally prove that this kind of mechanism exists, that there is some binding. What it then leads to, that's a different question, if it's relevant or if it's just one out of many effects in the many body system. How do we do this? Well, I'm working with quantum gas microscopes, which were famously um, first introduced here in Harvard, and uh, just a little bit later in, in Munich. And uh, by now, there's a whole collection of these microscopes around the world, all with uh, pretty and beautifully colored uh, pictures. Um, if I forgot one, please remind me, because of course, we have in, in a sign where, where new and new, more and more results are coming up. And I'm going to focus on the experiment that I've been working with, which is this one here in Munich with lithium-6. And um, here's a quick outline of my talk for today. So after introducing the experimental platform, I will go to the uh, one-hole system and introduce this concept of these magnetic polarons. Then I will talk a little bit more about engineering of lattice models. So how do we bring in more control to actually probe and manipulate these kind of systems that we want to look at? And uh, finally, we will come to our results of whole pairing in uh, these mixed dimensional letters. If there's some time left, I'm happy to give a little outlook into um, our plans in the future, uh, where we um, want to upgrade this kind of system into something we call a quantum processor, or you could also call a little quantum computer. But uh, first, let me introduce a team that did all the work here. So on the left, you can see the experimental team with a, a PhD and postdocs. And, um, on the right, uh, our theory collaborations, which are really crucial to all the progress uh, we are doing here, because this is really growing out of an exchange of ideas, of methods, of analysis in this uh, context of the Fermi Hubbard model. So, um, quickly about the quantum gas microscope. Um, I'm sure you've seen all these pictures where one can see individual atoms lined up on a lattice. And, um, in practice, how do we do this? Well, we have a, a, a degenerate gas of lithium-6 atoms, which we load into a single plane of these, uh, the system. And um, then we further cool it, and uh, in our case, then uh, ramp it up into this um, 3D lattice of a single plane. And for imaging, we actually have to turn on a third lattice, uh, another lattice at the end. So we have a separation of the preparation and the physics to our imaging, which you can mainly forget about, but if you look at our pictures, you will always see that they're slightly distracted from the original uh, positions. Um, this is still the scheme uh, which we've been using for the last um, like roughly six, seven years, which have now been exchanged by a new lattice, but I'll come to that at the very end. Um, pictures then look something like, like uh, something like this. In our case, our resolution compared to the point spread function is, is uh, uh, really good. So one can see by eye the distribution of individual particles about doublons, about holes. And uh, basically from this, you, you digitalize it and then you run all your statistics and calculate your properties. So um, I don't need to introduce a Fermi Hubbard model in this context, but I would rather like to point out that for us as experimentalists, each of these terms is not like one more thing which you write down in your system, but something where you have to stick in a lot of work to bring it into the lab and to control it. And I will show you throughout the talk how we're basically uh, extending on our control on these parameters. And um, it's of course important to see that in the, in the half filling system, um, this, uh, this Fermi Hubbard model maps to the Heisenberg model with an exchange rate of 4t squared over u from a second order process. And that, of course, leads then to a Heisenberg um, magnetic order, where, um, which is beyond the simple nail order, you get these spin fluctuations. And um, a little bit more about this in a moment. Let me first introduce to you how we are actually measuring these spins. 
So we developed a special technique here where one can really see both spins on a single realization. So one gets the full statistics of uh, each shot. In, um, experimentally, we do this by splitting on every side the um, spin ups in one direction and the spin downs in the other directions. And we do this vertically and then pump these two planes to a dif distance of about 20 micrometer. And there with a the microscope, you can take two pictures and um, uh, combine those two pictures basically into your full uh, resolved um, system. And here's the overview about the Heisenberg spin model which I wanted to give. This is of course a model which has been studied for now almost uh, 100 years and um, a, a lot is known about it and so I will just point out a, a few of the most important points is that basically while you go down in dimensionality the spin fluctuations become more and more important and the nature of the system also changes and um, for us as experimentalists working on small scale systems we are less interested into the, in these kind of long range uh, properties that are mainly studied in condensed matter systems but what matters for us is really more the local physics about three, four, maybe five lattice sites and um, this is the one that we want to understand of what's going on there and so in this case the main thing that matters is the correlation strength basically over uh, short um, distances. And um, here I need to in particular point out this ladder system. So that lives basically in between the 1D and the 2D system, as does a bilayer system which would live in between the 2D and the 3D system that we heard about earlier from Andrea. And um, the specialty here is that you get very strong short range uh, correlations which are then decaying exponentially because of a, a gap in the system. Um, here a quick example of um, if we look at these kind of spin correlations, this is now for 1D, um, one can, we, we typically plot those as a function of distance and then compare them to some kind of theory to extract um, our, our temperature of the system. Which in this case turned out to be something like T over T equals 0 0.2 and if you now think about Zoe, Zoe's talk, I think like okay that sounds really really cold, one needs to be careful because all these numbers always conte conte uh, depend on the context. Right? So we have to really look at all the numbers that are relevant. What is the U over T at this case? What is the geometry you are looking at? So the best number to really look at, and Zori beautifully did this in the last talk, of course, is to look at the entropy per particle, because that's the only quantity that is meaningful to be compared among different uh, geometries. And there we are in a range of 0.3 to 0.4 kb per particle, um, which is well, I would say intermediate uh, temperature scale, where you can see some exciting things, but of course we would really like to get colder. Um, here are the same results in 2D, so if one plots the spin correlation, one sees how they don't decay, at least over system sizes of like five, six sites, and you get this characteristic pi pi uh, correlation uh, value. This was of course um, the big success is about five years ago when this was first realized. Um, um, especially here in uh, Harvard also with the results at, at MIT and from Markus Greiner's group who really was the first one to see these kind of long-range British correlations that span basically the entire uh, system. And uh, so now let me come to the more complicated part of the part where uh, one goes away and puts in the doping into the system which was, is the topic of the meeting here that brought us here. So what happens if we now uh, dopes this well, we get another axis on our uh, diagram plot and if one tracks the uh, development of our Hamiltonian one ends up in the so-called TJ star model so um, we still have our spin interactions so hopping is restricted to uh, processes which don't uh, create uh, doublons and if you carefully do this derivation there's another term with the um, next nearest neighbor order uh, spin hopping which often is neglected but one should keep in mind that if you come from the Fermi Hubbard model this term is actually there and it can be quite relevant especially when you look at quantitative uh, comparison how much it qualitatively changes things that's something one can discuss um, just to quickly illustrate this kind of process the idea is that you have a hole and a spin pair and basically the hole hops by two sides and in the meantime flips or doesn't flip the two spins in between and the whole three body process happens also on the time scale of J so this is why it's uh, relevant and uh, should be kept in such an expansion and then of course one can look at this as a function of doping and hopefully recover some of this uh, phase diagram that I've been introducing in the beginning 
but I will only look now at the very beginning, so going to doping of very, very small numbers. Um, so let's start with this one whole example, and I'm representing this in the beginning. This one whole hops by one side, produces some uh, frustration here, but uh, now with a microscope one can directly look at these kind of distributions. And this is something we did a couple of years ago, so you post-select on your pictures to the position of your uh, dopant, and look at the spin environment uh, around that. And um, so if one does this, and here I'm looking at the correlations across the diagonals, one strikingly finds that while far away, you kind of see the normal ferromagnetic alignment, the ferromagnetic correlations between particles, while if you go closer to this dopant, the sign is uh, even flipped of the correlations. And uh, so that kind of shows these pictures that every, every dopant gets stressed with like a changed spin correlations, which then all together forms a new quasi-particles, which should be the actual um, particle on which you should do your theory in the next step of looking at how these uh, are behaving. Um, so how does this further go? Okay, if the ho hole keeps hopping further, one also gets these kind of changed correlations, just to quickly illustrate where this is coming from. I mean, you see it really just, this hole has moved over here, so then you kind of see the, that the diagonal part now has a has a, a negative correlation instead of a, a positive one. And um, as I showed before, the, the, the hole won't move infinitely far because it costs more and more energy. And in addition, there's another process which is going on, which is that the spin isn't frozen, but already after two hops, you can do a little uh, spin flop on the time scale of J, and that basically repairs uh, the spin correlations. And um, if one calculates this, um, we, we got, even in this frozen model, uh, a, a, a length of the system which is very compatible with what we see, which is about one site. So that's the size of this kind of object. At, and this, of course, this is one thing one needs to add here, uh, T over J is roughly 3 in this experiment. Of course, if you make uh, the T over J bigger, it will spread out more. It takes a longer time until the J kicks in and starts uh, moving the hole around. So this is something that we looked at here at the correlations, basically how do they decay as a function of distance from the hole back to the uh, background value. The same thing can be studied um, <coughs> dynamically, and there was a beautiful experiment here in Harvard where basically you poke this hole into the system and you look how it moves, and um, that of course probes the same kind of physics just in a dynamic way. And uh, they saw then uh, the same effect that for small scales one can describe it by simple hopping and for larger scales you need to bring in these spin exchanges, which is of course something we don't see here uh, in this uh, experiment. Before I come to the two-hole system, let me um, talk a little bit about what I call engineering lattice Hamiltonians. Because there's one more tool um, which has become more and more popular over the last year, which is this, uh, a, di a digital micromirror device or a spatial light modulator, something that allows you to tune your optical field on the level of the individual sites. And you can, of course, use that to just cut out systems of your um, uh, lattice to only populate certain sites and not other ones, which can be used to create these kind of reservoirs here, for example. But you can also go a step further and really only apply tuned, weak offsets on individual sites. And if you do that, and then you calculate your spin exchange by the second order process, you find your J. Your J is changing only a little bit, because basically you have these two terms in the uh, ex expansions, and uh, this delta is the one that I can tune now with my local uh, offsets. So as long as this is small, the J stays almost the same, but if I can make it strong, I can even change the sign, because as soon as this delta here becomes bigger than u, this term basically is negative and dominates over that one here, so the whole exchange turns from antiferromagnetic to ferromagnetic. And um, one can really envision this now to do this locally, because you can do a different offset on every site, which allows you to basically program some kind of a spin-spin um, interaction Hamiltonian into your system. Uh, of course, there are a few constraints because, well, you can only do local offsets, so you cannot do arbitrary patterns of those J's, but uh, I think it's a great start to get into this more local control. And, um, of course, one can need to then also look if I have a dope system, what does this mean in this context? And then one has to be, of course, careful now, because you cannot individually tune your T's, but it's actually just the T's are either there at your bare value, or you turn them off if you tilt more than a few T's, such that the hopping process, the direct hopping process, can't happen anymore. 
So basically, um, you, can, you can turn the T off or keep it on. Uh, well, and if you change your J a lot, of course, you will, you will have to go into the regime where you turn your hopping, your, your tunneling off. And um, of course, you can also use this to tune your mean density. This is something that people have done for a long time to basically make large regions of mod insulators or 0.2 doping or something like this. And there, you always have to compare your energy scales to the um, to basically the, the compressibility at this system at this point. So for mod insulators, it's easy. For other ones, it's harder. How do we do this experimentally? Well, we put some kind of pattern here uh, on the DMD and um, shine it onto the light. And then we can take pictures and, and see what these kind of average densities are. And if in here we also apply some kind of uh, additional potential, we can do this tuning of the J's and of the hoppings. Uh, as an example here, I'm showing you uh, experiments that we did to tune um, a, a ferromagnetic, antiferromagnetic system. So if you tilt the ladder here such that all these sides A have a different offset compared to B and you get a ferromagnetic coupling along this way, you can really reach a system which has basically uh, uh, spin one coupling in that axis and then an antiferromagnetic coupling in the other direction, which of course is some kind of a spin one chain and um, allows you to study very different physics that you can't reach uh, naturally otherwise. And I don't want to talk about the details. We work on SPT phases here. Uh, in the last year. What I actually want to talk about and um, is uh, what I've been promising in the title and how this is used to look at uh, hole pairing and uh, this is of course where the mixed dimensional system comes in. So what do I mean by mixed dimensional system? This term is something that uh, Fabian and Annabelle I think introduced and um, the idea is that you have a, your spin and your charge differently behaving uh, in uh, the two dimensions. So concretely, what I'm looking at here is a 2D spin system that has a J that is more or less, uh, or, or that is antiferromagnetic in the case in both directions, but I have a hopping which is zero in one direction, but finite in the other direction. And um, so um, let me first come back to this, this whole whole uh, pairing aspect that works in these kind of ladder systems which we've been using for this experiment for mainly for simplicity <coughs> in the beginning uh, is the same thing that I was introducing in the beginning. So a hole moves around, that costs some energy, and a second hole can come and uh, repair the kind of system. So if we now do this in a ladder, so we create this kind of system, give it some coupling, give it some motion, and look at the whole hole uh, G2 function. So how are the holes distributing? Then the question is, what, what, what are we seeing? Does this lead to pairing? And uh, the experimental answer, which at this point we already knew, because you can of course calculate it in these small systems, is that no, there's no sign of any kind of uh, pairing. Because, um, of, of, let me first to show you what, 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 what I'm plotting here. So I'm looking at the function of distance between my two holes, and uh, I'm, putting like, I'm, I'm looking at cases where I have one hole on the lower bottom row of my uh, ladder and the other leg has another hole, looking at the relative distance and just counting basically how often do these events occurring converted into a G2 function. So at distance zero, where the two holes are right next to each other, the, the probability is, is strongly reduced, which is of course the opposite of pairing. So if you pair, you should be stick closer to, to each other. And um, the um, reason for this is quite easy to understand. Uh, it just has to do with that these are fermionic hardcore particles which can't sit on top of each other and they just like to do their polaronic, their like local micro motion to lower their energy on the level of an individual particle. If I put a second particle right next to it, that costs a lot of energy in this context, so they just don't like to do this. And that happens on the time on the energy scale of T and not J, because my binding here is only happening on the la layer of, of, of J. So um, that process dominates this Pauli repulsion and there's no type of uh, binding or, or at least in this uh, experimental observables and we can discuss what this means at the ground state uh, at the end. But now comes in this mixed dimensional idea. So if I turn off my popping in this direction, there's no energy cost anymore uh, of bringing two holes next to each other. Basically, they already paid it, right? I, so I went to this kind of system where, where everybody, where the kinetic energy of the hole is just... Uh, um, lower for the bandwidth has been reduced. And now they can sit next to each other and if one does this, yes, one does indeed see that holes at short distances 
uh, like to bunch up. So we, we're finding this kind of paired, um, these pairs of holes sitting on the same rung of the system, which we take out our, our experimental sign of that, that they're bound. Um, from the strength, this is about a 15% enhancement compared to the statistic distribution that one uh, would be uh, effect uh, expecting by just randomly distributing these particles. And it does match also some calculations that one puts in at these temperatures I was showing before, which is around 0 0.7, 0 0.8 uh, J. And we can directly use these experimental results now to, in a very crude model, basically estimate a binding energy. You just say, OK, if they're next to each other, they have a reduced energy. And um, you do uh, simple statistical physics. And by that, you, you estimate when do I get a, a, a signal of this strength. And from that, we conclude that the binding energy is on the order of our temperature, so 0.8 J. So the temperature is the same, so you see some kind of result. If we know, of course, it would be colder, um, you would see a much stronger sig signal. Plus, things change a bit because the, um, it's a dynamic binding, right? Because the spin order changes its temperature. And that creates the binding. So the binding energy is not a fixed number, but something that also depends on the, the, the spin. But first, um, let me show you here that this is uh, not affected by our finite size of the system. So we've been doing this on, on 14 particles, 7 by 2. But numerically, we can uh, run this in, in larger systems of up to like 40, uh, lengths of 40. And the, the change is really uh, quite minimal. So basically, just this offset here. Uh, goes away, but otherwise you can see the correlation strength uh, stays uh, roughly the same. The temperature of the calculation here is slightly lower, which is why this value is a bit different from these ones here, but it's local physics, so the system size is really not the uh, crucial um, ingredient here. Um, we can also look at the, at the spin correlations around those holes, or basically the effect that the holes have on the spins now. So if I have no hole, I find very strong spin correlation in these systems, which has to do with this letter geometry that they locally pair uh, into, into singlets. Then I start doping it, and one can clearly see how the correlation value goes down really quickly, which is, of course, a sign of this frustration. Holes move around, destroy your spin order. If I go now to the mixed decays, where this pairing is happening, I see a very different behavior. So in the beginning, there's a kind of just tic-tac. So one hole, it's not paired, destroys some spins. I put in a second hole, those two holes pair, and then have much less effect, because those two holes together can move through the system without doing any damage. So I almost recover my uh, correlation strength at zero holes. And then for more holes, I guess the whole system gets a bit more messy, plus our detection fidelity start kicking in that even versus odd cannot be perfectly distinguished. And then we see a, some decrease of correlation strength, but much less compared to the case over here. Um, uh, furthermore, we looked at this as a function of temperature. So um, if, we, if we heat up our system and um, the, the correlation strength goes down, so low temperature, higher temperatures here on the left, singlet strengths, which we use as our thermometer, are, 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 are here on the bottom. And uh, here is the G2 function again, so how uh, much the holes are pairing. And in blue, in this mixed dimensional case, one can clearly see how the binding of the holes goes down. It's less and less likely, which just makes sense that you're basically your binding energy gets lower and your temperature gets higher, so most of our pairs are thermally dissolving. While in, in the standard case, well, there's no binding and that doesn't care, change much uh, when you change the temperature because it's Pauli, of course, doesn't depend on a, on a temperature scale. Um, maybe one word about uh, theory. In this perspective, so here we run uh, some um, DMRG calculations in really large systems at zero temperature to um, comment on the question: Isn't there a binding in the um, uh, in the standard case? Because if you go to to, to more theory books and you look at like Lattinger liquid descriptions, there you typically find just people saying yes, there is a charge gap in these systems at like uh, any kind of situation. So you, there should be some kind of a binding, the charge gap is associated with the binding of these, of these holes. But uh, it, it, it must be really, really, really weak. Because in these systems, even over 80 signs, we find no sign of any binding at our parameters, which is shown here in the corner. So um, the J-perp and the T-parallel roughly on the same scale. So the mixed decays, you have the very strong binding here. And in the other case, they really keep avoiding each other. 
So if there's a binding, it must be over even longer length scales such that these 80 sites are not yet enough to basically get around this. And if one looks into the literature of the binding energies, those are typically given on the range of like 0.05 at the optimal parameters. So at our parameters, maybe more like 0.01 J. So the one that we're creating here with this trick really boosts things by at least a factor of 10, which is of course the way how we could make it visible, but also something one can think about conceptually that basically the, the binding that might be happening in real materials is actually just a residual binding between two con or between an attractive and a repulsive process. If you turn off the repulsive project, you boost it massively. Um, well, one can make any use of that in the future and real materials, of course, is something I don't want to comment on. Um, one last thing, because I think I'm running quite how many time on time. 35. Um, so here we looked at uh, slightly higher dopings. So we take the same letter and put, like in this case, four holes into the system and look at their, their, their mutual pair pair correlation function. So we post select on shots where, where these pairs appear, these, these holes appear as pairs, and then we look at how do they distribute in space. And what one can see is that there's a, there's a clear structure to it, which is, of course, strongly affected now by the finite size of the system and we can basically just understand it that those whole pairs they try to avoid the boundaries of our system and they try to avoid each other. So if you have two of those pairs on the seven sides you just get a, a clear peak at a distance of four and the question is now how sharp is this peak? That would be something that tells you whether there's some kind of crystallization going on, some charge density wave or uh, if this is just a Friedel oscillation kind of effect that one would get for by basically non-interacting um, holes. This we can't comment on in this kind of small systems, uh, but for, for three pairs you get the, the equivalent pattern. And it would be of course very exciting to explore that further, basically whether one can see an onset of some kind of a charge order that is uh, being produced by those whole pairs in the system. But what it does show us uh, directly is that these pairs are not that they're mobile, right? Because if they would be just stuck at one pair, there wouldn't be any correlations between them because they just could be created wherever they were. But because if they move, they kind of know about each other and they can keep their quantum mechanical distance uh, by, by maximizing or minimizing the kinetic energy. And um, this is the last part, let me keep this quite brief. But um, so we've been, think been thinking a lot of basically how one can take and further improve on these kind of platforms. and. Um, with this huge wave of quantum computing that's been going uh, on in the last years. Um, of course, one can ask, is there something one can take and learn from this kind of system and apply it to our uh, lattice uh, simulators? Because more or less, most of the ingredients uh, exist and one basically has to put them together. What do I mean by, by when I say quantum computing? It's basically the idea of doing things in a gateway, in a gate-like fashion. So instead of having this continuous time revolution or some Hamiltonian, you, you do local time gates between particles to change your quantum state. And um, one can look at one qubit gate, so individual particles, in our case it would typically be a spin rotation that one would be thinking about here, and a two qubit gate which can lead to entanglement between uh, two particles. And um, the scheme that we came up with, what one can do in, a, in this kind of lattice system that I was presenting to you so far, is that for, for one qubit gate, one needs to point lasers at individual particles to rotate this. That would be uh, some kind of Raman transition. How one does this in detail, I'm happy to discuss with the experimentalist. Our current plan is to use two lasers and basically co-propagate them to focus them on an individual particle to do a Raman transition without any momentum kick. So you stay in your motional state, but you can do any kind of one qubit rotations. For the collisional gates, one needs to bring in um, some, some way to basically have two particles interact with each other without every, everything else interacting and moving around at the same time. So you would work in some kind of a frozen regime, then pick up some particles that you want to entangle, bring them next to each other, and then do these collisional gates, which I will talk a little bit more about uh, in a second on um, how this uh, allows you to, to, to do a controlled entanglement uh, between two particles. So how does this work? If I have two particles in a double well, I, I lower the, um, the barrier so they start tunneling, then 
they will do uh, some spin flip after some time. At the end, this is nothing more than our J exchange that I was talking about the entire time, just locally on one side in a controlled on and off by uh, turning your T. One can calculate this and one can see, like, one can actually do this at some uh, parameter sessions that you only get this kind of spin oscillation and not um, additional W occupied sides and six. So, um, uh, and there was, of course, a beautiful experiment where this was done in, in 2020 in Heidelberg in John Wycan's group, and there they already achieved fidelities above 99% for this kind of uh, collision. So the technology is definitely there that one can do this collisional gate. What is missing is how to integrate it into the existing many-body simul quantum simulators and bring in the local programmability. And this is something we have quite a lot of ideas on to basically use our DMD or use some additional tweezers that move around particles to make this process local. Because then you can really do uh, a step-by-step -step building up of your um, correlations. The crucial part of this, of course, is the super lattices. Here's a sketch of a new uh, design of our new lattices, which we've been building uh, over the last year. It's going to be a bichromatic lattice uh, with a face stable um, phase stable in interferometric setup here, which we put into a vacuum onto a zero dual plate to really try to get as much noise out of the system as possible. It's still preliminary, but it looks like the phase stability is going to be um, all right. It's going to be really good. We'll have to see. <laughs> um, and, and now, um, as, as a last step, a quick vision of, my, of, this, of this protocol. So if you had this, you could really do something where you start with a simple state. This is very much like what Zoe was saying. Start with a simple state that you can create with low entropy. Then you apply, in this case, these digital gates to move it into something really complicated or just into whatever you like to have. And um, so you can make some like local <coughs> clusters of entangled state, or you can make some kind of long-range entanglement without entanglement in between. Uh, you can even build some, some trial wave functions for like something you want to test. And I'm dreaming here, right? Um, and, and then you would, would switch to an analog time evolution. So now you start your actual simulation based on these shots. You run it, and at the end, you apply some more digital gates to read it out in some kind of a basis. So with this, um, let me finish and come back to the results which already exist, um, um, which is in particular this whole pairing, which of course we take as a starting point to now go on, try to do this in extended 2D systems and try to characterize the properties of these whole pairs. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, so on this question of finite size effects, can you show that data again on the pair correlations? Not the pair pair, but the earlier. Uh, the main one, this one here? Uh, that one. So it looks like on the bottom right there, there's, you have the two graphs, the one on the left that's showing G2. <coughs> that one. You were here? No, the, that one, yeah. Yes. So it looks like the L equals seven and L equals 10 are distinctly different from the the others. Um, yes, so there's, they, they show, I mean, if, if, if I look at this, this graph, you can say yes, they, they are a little bit higher. So um, there's, there's some uh, finite size uh, correction <coughs> effect, which has to do with, uh, with the spin correlations that are building up in the system. Basically, how you're in between the, the configuration where, where you have all these singlets just lined up in the system and how they're turning, and you get more and more of these oscillations, and you basically uh, have a uh, some, so, so basically the correlation length in the systems, uh, even though it's gapped, of course in our case is, I think, a factor of three, four, five below the system, which is big but not infinite. And then for the other system, this becomes infinite. This is how I understand this step, that you kind of go to some, some value once you're at 10. But uh, of course it's not, it's not changing by factor of two. Nice talk, Timo. Uh, I have a technical question also about this slide. So when you perform the DMD slicing with the 2x7 uh, region, I know sometimes you can maybe have some mismatch and the boundaries you might create some undesired holes. And you also do post-selection, right, for these data? So how do you know that you're not artificially creating some hole pairs just at the edges? Are, are the holes 
equally distributed, equally likely through the URA? Very good question. Of course, this is the, what I've all been hiding and what we spend most of the time on experimentally because it is not easy to make this kind of DMD patterns to perfectly match your lattice sites. And um, so on the one hand, we have a, a, a feedback mechanism. So we basically look at uh, if there's, for example, some imbalance building up between the two sites because this is slowly drifting, and then we kind of push the DMD signal back in the opposite direction. Um, the length of the chains, I'm saying here it's seven. That's actually not so sharp, exactly for the effect that you are saying that sometimes the edge states are a little bit uh, affected by the surrounding potential and uh, so we deliberately leave out those sites. So if you look at our density profile, basically the edges, um, if you would count all the, the sites, they basically have a, some slightly different density. So if their holes are there, we don't count them, we only count the ones in the middle. And there it's reasonably uh, homogeneous, plus we've been looking at these tests to really make sure that these are not whole pairs which you're creating by some kind of a potential. And in particular, that, of course, should be affecting both the standard and the mixed dimensional case. A related question. I'm a bit confused. Can you turn on the hopping in the vertical direction while still retain the exchange intention? Yes, yes, one can. So this, um, if, you, if you give things an offset, so the hopping matrix element is still there. But because the detuning is much bigger than the hopping, in our case, we're using uh, roughly half of the, the U, so that's about seven times more than the, than the T. Basically, this process is highly detuned and plays barely any role that particles are really moving over there. But for this, for this second order uh, virtual process, you just get a renormalization of the energy of that intermediate state, where basically one particle has hopped here. It is now U plus delta or U minus delta. So that the, this J just changes a little bit. And we take this into account for our uh, description, of course. So th that's really the, 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 the idea that um, Fabian and Annabelle mainly came up with in this context, that one can tune the top hopping and the J independently, if you only want to turn off the T. I'm a bit confused. Isn't that J the proportional to the hopping, the vertical direction? Isn't that to the square? And right yes, you? yes, which is why basically now there are, there, there are two types of Ts. There is the, the bare T, which is in your matrix, and uh, that one we don't change. And uh, then there are the effects, so you, there, there's the bare Hubbard, which basically has T's, has U's, and deltas for the offsets. And then you go to the effective description, which now gets a hopping T tilde, let's call it T tilde, which normally is the same as T, but if you have this whole offset, we say it's effectively zero. So that T tilde basically becomes zero. Then there is this J, which is always an effective parameter which just derives out of the upper ones. And that one more or less retains its original value of T squared over U, but not T tilde squared over U. So maybe just to clarify, it's a metastable state because you create it in balance. Ultimately, both holes will go to one chain, but it takes a very long time, longer than the time scale of this experiment, and that's why you want to say fundamentally it's as if you switch off T probe on the time scale of the experiment. But, but actually, a J probe is not just T squared, it's T squared over energy denominator. And that energy denominator they made small, and that's why J space is finite, or T probe effectively is centered. Yeah. So when, when you project the Hubble model to the when you project the Hubble model to the TJ model, we know that there is a, a three side term which is proportional to J. That's a hopping term, but yes. the, that's a proportional to J. And uh, uh, when you when you consider the, uh, the, the the mixed dimensional system, you are talking about the TJ model. Um, yes. So there is this this um, this. Uh, this term of the three, the H N N N, what I was calling it there, which also comes in here, and it does uh, give you additional processes, and we do keep those in the uh, description. So if we basically we run numerics both in the T J and in this T J star model and in the full Fermi Hubbard, and full Fermi Hubbard and T J star is basically identical at U equal 14 T, but uh, for between the other ones you do find um, differences, and generally the, um, the this additional terms gives you more ways for individual holes to delocalize. And um, in this way, basically, 
makes the, makes the binding less favorable. So it's easier to do binding in the TJ model compared to the Hubbard model. I'm also a bit confused about this. You have zero or one hopping in along the run. I mean, if I sit, think of a very simple two-level system, you detune it, you get Rabi oscillations, which are faster but have lower amplitude. You should have the same thing, right? You're yeah. saying you're, you're, you're averaging about the fast uh, oscillations that do nothing and faster than everything else, and your amplitude is the small relaxation that, that Eugene was, was mentioning, right? This is, this is yes. the challenge. Yes, I think for the relaxation, you really need to go to high-order processes so that, that they, they need to be the many-body effect that basically on some, some very high order for fifth order terms or so you can have a hole go from one leg to another while dumping all of its entropy in the spin bath of the other particles, which gives you some kind of a, a, a time scale for a given system size. And we haven't explored this uh, systematically. We run a few calculations and we notice that it's, it's actually quite hard to find that you really go to exactly u over 2. From the energy skill, you might say u over 3 should be good enough. You're still detuned by many, many t's, but it, it does already make a difference. Yeah, second question. Can I ask one more? <laughs> is, is in your blow data, is that actually a signal? I mean, it's, I, I can ask the question a bit more nicely. I don't do it. I ask you later. But the, <laughs> the, the, the blue, uh, the, you, you know the, 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 um, the shape of the background? Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, if I compare that to theory, it looks like it's out of the error bus. Okay, do we have an interpretation? So that this data is not taken only on two holes, but we're taking basically natural, we, we try to do a doping of two holes, but then we keep the natural fluctuation of whole numbers. So this also contains cases with uh, three holes and with four holes. And of course those cases now also affect your correlator, because you're correlating all holes in the system, right? So we're fairly sure that this additional structure we see here in the, in the tail of the distribution are caused by those additional uh, particles. And of course by the finite size system because uh, it's, it's not um, like, like every hole sits in a wave function that kind of distributes. That does this, right? So it does another trend. Your finite size is down there, right? Yes, so, so the, that's flat and then this, 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 this offset here, that mainly goes away. I mean, the, the, there is some rule basically that if I have some correlation here, I also need to have some correlation here because everything together with the right prefactors needs to sum to zero. And that's of course what's creating these fairly strong positive correlations here just because one has strong negative correlation. So this is the finite size of the 1 over L effect which we can correct for. We decided not to just to keep the analysis simple. Um, so, so, so if you post-select to, to have less holes, only to two, your error bars go up, but that thing tends to flatten? I mean, I understand this offset thing. I, it's just the shape, which uh, I, I'm wondering that you have there. Yes, yeah? yes. So um, we, we, we never saw this point become positive, which is something we were looking for, because that would be kind of the size of your wave function of your bound pairs. And but uh, you, you do get rid of this kind of structure, so all these points here become at least consistent with each other over this uh, part. Of course, everything is in the already here, you can barely claim that structure on the own error bars, right? So, which is why. Well, there is some structure. I, I would say there is some structure. We had some discussion about this, and we understand it in terms of these things. But now, if you post select to exactly two holes, you reduce your amount of data by a factor of five or whatever, so the error bars go up. And then it becomes even harder to say, is this flat? No, it is not flat. flat. So, um. so we're running a bit late. Maybe a last urgent question. <laughs> oh, I, I have a very quick clarifying question. In your G24 pairs, uh, you, seem to have, you seem to have a much larger signal for these type of you know, stripy orders. Uh, I was wondering if that's also in your mixed D. This is in the mixed D system, yes, okay. yes, because otherwise we don't have these, these pairs in the first place. Um, and and yes, so the, this this structure here is more more spiky than you would expect from just independent uh, quantum particles, which led to a lot of discussions. But the system is small, and we don't want to make any claims. So then let's uh, thank you all again. And, uh,